Man, I don't know what the hell's going on these days, but it seems like the world is falling apart in Lexington, Kentucky. The Lexington sky is falling, Josh Tech. John Calipari now, for some reason, has the biggest bullseye on his back. And everybody that follows the Big Blue Nation thinks that the team is 0-17 and and it couldn't get any worse than this. So let's check the pulse and see what the heck's going on. Let's talk about it here in the fast break. Um, Kentucky. Let's start at the very top. Are they are they underperform? Like, why are we where we are? Well, they they are underperforming expectations. First sure. of all, they came in. You know, they came in on <clears throat> on Ken Palm. They were the number one ranked team coming into the country, and I think pretty much everybody that you would talk to would have had them as national title favorites, national title contenders, Final Four favorites. They were getting all the typical preseason Kentucky hype, right? And rightfully so. This roster. When you look at it, there's, there's a lot of studs on it. There's a lot of really good players. They have the National Player of the Year returning. When does that happen, right? You, when do you have the National Player of the Year returning besides, you know, Tyler Hansborough at North Carolina? So I think it's just the expectations that were built up before the season. When you look at the roster, it's really good. And then now they're kind of really underperforming. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, like, there's not too many programs that have this type of immediate dissatisfaction with a high-level team. And all your points are well – are well received, but we're also talking about a team about a team that hasn't really done really well in the, in the postseason. Um, they've been an unbelievable recruiting powerhouse for years, right? Like the Kentucky brand is as strong as it's ever been on the recruiting side of things. Um, but I mean, listen, they're ten and six. Okay, yeah. at the time we're recording it, like it could be a lot worse. It could be a lot worse. It, it could be, but I think it's just a matter of it's it it's not just this year. It's it's a lot of build up right they a couple years ago they had that season where they only won nine games they missed the tournament obviously that's never going to cut it in lexington you know the year after that which was last season they got bounced in the what first round second round by yeah. St. Peters. that's obviously not going to cut yeah. it i think it's just a building up that's gotten to this point i think kentucky fans have steadily grown tired of john calipari and then now that you know they've gotten off to a 10 and 6 start and they're losing to you know south carolina who was you know, 240th or 243rd in the net at the time, that's just not a good look for Kentucky. And I think that's just kind of sending one of the most rabid fan bases in all of sports. Like, I don't think that's hyperbole at all. One of the most rabid fan bases in all of sports over the edge. And when you lose them, you don't have anything else to fall back on. Yeah, I mean, it, it is, yeah. You, you've lost your safety rope for sure. And you go down the bottom of, uh, of the valley, no doubt about it. You know, it's interesting, like, you know, Shashevsky retires. Jay Wright retires. Roy William retires. We're in the we're in the back half of careers for guys like, you know, Bill Self and Tom Izzo and Jim Beheim and some of these stalwarts that we've seen so often. Um, you know, and Cal Perry's right there with them. Yeah, and absolutely. I actually I've always been a huge Cal Perry guy. I think he's a straight shooter. I don't think he really hides too much. I think is what you see is what you get. He doesn't shrink away from from his style. Um, he doesn't shrink away from his his resume. He doesn't shrink away from the fact that Kentucky is Kentucky. Um, he is not afraid to drive the most expensive car down the street, uh, freshly washed, and have the music playing as loud as he can. Yeah. I don't mind that at all. Yeah, no, no, no. There, there's a place for that, especially at a brand like Kentucky. You need a guy that's as big as the brand, right? And for, you know, he still is, but for, for that period of time between 2012 or whenever 2010 when he got there to, like, you know, most – Recently, let's say you yeah. know, 2010, 2020, whatever. He was the guy for Kentucky because he was big. He was flashy. He matched the program, right? So I think all of your points are, are valid that, you know, he was, you know, he's still a guy to be, you know, to respect and to be revered and all that. He's still one of the more elite names in, in the sport. Sure. But I do wonder, like, why did all these guys call it a career, right? Like Krzyzewski, I get it, right? Like it was, it was time, you know, Roy Williams, same thing. But Jay Wright was one of those guys you're like, okay, well, he wins a couple championships, He's been in the mountain twice, also totally fine. Yep. And I think with that expectation at Kentucky, they believe they can win it every single season, which there aren't a lot of jobs in any sport that believe that. Yeah. Right. Like maybe the Yankees and the Cowboys and like we're talking national, you know, international big brands. And, you know, he hasn't, right? He hasn't. So the question now becomes, is it time? Is is the model in which he's built the program kind of ran its course. And sometimes, sometimes after you've just painted over the walls year after year after year, you've got to strip the walls down to bare. Yeah. And I wonder, are we at that place now with Kentucky that you just got to go get the varnish and take it all the way back down to the wood? 
Yeah, I'm starting to think so because when you have this kind of, you know, vitriol to, where, to the point where your own fan base is bringing in signs telling you to go to Texas and getting kicked out for it, like and when you're getting down to that level of hate, when you're kind of – when I go on to Twitter anytime Kentucky's playing and Calipari's trending, like – Let's just let's just have a clean break here, and I don't care who initiates it. If Calipari wants to find a a, a way to parachute out and land somewhere else, if Kentucky's like, hey man, you got to get out of here, like it's just not working right now. And I don't yeah. think that the mountain to climb in order to win Big Blue Nation back is probably more trouble than it's worth at this point. If we're being honest. Well, okay. So a lot of times we see this in college sports where. I don't know if this – like this conversation of John Calipari maybe being on the out only came after the hills that Chris Beard was let go at yeah. Texas. That's when it really kind of caught fire and really started to gain some steam, right? And, and that's how it works in college sports or really any coaching job where it's just this domino effect. And I do wonder if that kind of sparked this whole conversation, referring back to the sign that you had mentioned about him going to Texas. And so, so to that end, is this an opportunity for a clean break for a guy like Cal to say, hey, you know what? Yeah, cool. Buy me out. Let's call it. Let's wash our hands of it. Been an unbelievable decade and, and a half. Um, we've had some great memories. We have some unbelievable players that came through. It's time. It's time. Austin sounds like an unbelievable place to go. And I'm going to go down to Texas and go be a Longhorn, uh, the Longhorns new head coach, which I think bears its own podcast in and of itself if that happens. But, I mean, is that – I do wonder, does that – did all this kind of come into focus because of the Chris Beard domino effect? I have to – I got to think that it has something to do with it. Yeah, definitely, because it, it provides it at least provides a landing spot for him, right? Like we now we know that there is another high level job where you can recruit high level players that has a lot of money and resources sure. and everything that a guy like John Calipari would ever want. Texas is open, they have that, right? So now it provides us a place where well he could go to Texas and that will open up Kentucky. Everybody's happy. Yeah. I think he could slay it at Texas. I really do. Dude, I mean, He's already crushed it in Texas in recruiting. Remember that 2015 team? A lot of those guys on that team were built out of Texas guys. And then you also had Julius Randle, who I believe was from yep. Texas, right? Yep, he, he, yep. he recruits Texas pretty well. So I don't I think that'll just be easy for him. And I think, you know, if he decides to go that way, and they're also really, you know, a big Nike brand. So if he decides to go that way, I don't think, you know, I don't think he'll have any trouble there at all. Well, he won't have any. I mean, listen, he's got the number one recruiting class on paper coming in, in the class of 2023 already. We've talked about this. Let's kind of run through their class real fast. DJ Wagner. Okay. His high school teammate, Aaron Bradshaw, seven footer, uh, Justin Edwards, Reed Shepard, um, who am I forget? Robert Dillingham. Okay. So number one recruiting class. And so if you're Kentucky, okay, you're going to owe him a lot of money. I mean, a ton of money, which I don't think is that big of a problem. I think anytime a college or university wants to make a change, they find a way to make it happen. And certainly big blue nation, um, is, they got boosters, yeah, you know that. Yeah, they're more like Big Green Nation if they need yeah. to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I wonder, does it? Does number one, does that recruiting class get blown up if they do that? And are they going to lose some of these guys? Which I think you and I would both argue, like, yeah, that would really suck. But it's really not. You're going to anytime you make a significant coaching change, you're going to take a hit in recruiting on the on the yeah. short term, right? And so, like, let's start there. Like, is this a class that you? Is it worth blowing up your entire program in the in the thought of maybe losing these guys? So, so with this class, not not all number one classes are created equally. So, this number one class maybe not, you know, is not the same as next year's number one class or you know a number one years or number one class of years past. I think the twenty twenty three class as a whole is a little bit down. I think anybody you talk to that does this will tell you that. So, if you're going to lose a number one class, this one would be it. And let's be honest here, you're not losing Reed Shepard. He's a Kentucky legacy guy. I think yeah. he'll play at Kentucky if I'm coaching at Kentucky. So so right there you have a piece of the class that's remaining at least. And whoever you have coming in, hypothetically, they're going to be able to bring guys in. It's still Kentucky, right? You're still going to get high level guys in. Yeah. So, like, you may lose a portion of this class, but you're not going to lose all of it, and you're still going to be able to bring guys in. So I don't think that should be a deterrent. You know, I do wonder, too, like how long does this – potential change lasts right like we've seen it before when they moved on from tubby smith right and like you brought in billy gillespie and like that yeah. was absolute dumpster fire that happened there and so you do i do wonder like it took calipari a little bit of time to kind of get the ball rolling and then when it did i mean it never stopped right like kentucky was number one number one number one recruiting class all the time they had pro after pro after pro more pros than i think i think more pros than duke 
in that period of time. But, you know, I do wonder, does it take, um, I, don't, I don't know where to pivot because I think there's a lot of places that we can kind of go with this. Let's well, talk about recruiting style first. And I, okay. I think that's, I think that's the, the point that really think about to where we are. Obviously when he brings in as many one and dones as he, as he has, it's really, really hard to sustain that. Yeah. Like really, really hard. And let me kind of, and I always go back to this point, but I look back at Paul Hewitt when he was at Georgia tech. Okay. And they had a pro it seemed like every other year. Okay. They had, you know, Thaddeus Young, they had Derek Fabers, they had um, Javaris Critton, they had Ghani Lawal, they had all these guys that were a shortstop guy, but they also always had a Zach Peacock, okay? They always had a Mo Miller, they always had a player that kind of stayed the course that was there in their program, which always made them relevant. Now, I'm not saying Georgia Tech and Kentucky are comparable, but in the era, we didn't have a ton of one and dones like we do now. Yeah. And I think that was always the part when I look at, at Paul Hewitt and his success at Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech hasn't been as good since he left because of the style that he was. He knew that he had always had to go get a pro to be relevant in the ACC. And now Kentucky, they're bringing five pros every single yeah. season. But that roster turnover, man, that is so hard to sustain. Now you add an NIL, and it's a whole different element. Now it's more of the things that happen behind the scenes. It's more in the front scene, right? And so the recruiting style, the question that I have is, what kind of recruiting style is going to work now for a place like Kentucky and even Duke? And I think you have to look at Duke also as a place because we haven't talked about them. You know, they're yeah. in the top 25, but like number 23, number 24, not having the success. They also had a high level recruiting class and high level players coming in. Now I get it. Shashevsky leaves and there's a, there's a different talking point there, but the recruiting style that to me is the question is what do you think will work at a place like Kentucky moving forward? Because this obviously hasn't worked. Yeah, I, I think the recruiting style at Kentucky would be the recruiting style that's kind of, at least in my estimation, has been working across the country. You look at the number one team, at least on Ken Palm, uh, and probably in the AP poll as well, is, is Houston. And Houston is built on, you know, they have a roster filled with guys that fit their system, that fit how uh, Kevin uh, Kelvin Sampson wants to play, right? When you think of Houston, you think of toughness, you think of a specific type of player. And they also have, you know, guys who have been in the system for multiple years. They have some transfers, but then they've, you know, they've added Jarris Walker. They've added Terrence Arsenal. So they've added two five-star guys as opposed to adding, you know, five five-star guys, five pros and five guys who are new to college basketball, new to that system, new to whatever. So I think the trend in college basketball is getting old and then, you know, splicing in a couple of the high-level guys here and there. Yeah. I mean, it worked obviously with Oscar, right? Like it was a transfer that came in. But then again, like transfers also have not worked for Kentucky on some of the guys that they've taken, you know? Yeah, I mean? like, like, oh, good. Yeah. It's like some of those guys aren't good enough to go be Kentucky, but like, it's hard to get sustainable players. Now I do wonder like a, like a guy like Reed Shepard, like I actually think he makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Like, how definitely. long will he stay there? And is, is that the type of guy that you've got to have that sticks around for a while that can be a starter when you bring in another guy that maybe takes a little bit longer to kind of develop, you know what I mean? Yeah, you absolutely need that kind of guy. And, you know, when we talk about this one and done stuff, we got to give John Calipari credit because he really innovated. He changed the game in that regard. Yeah. Um, and I don't think Kentucky fans ever really loved it, right? Kentucky's a really traditional fan base. And they want those guys like the Reed Shepherds that are going to be there for a long time that they can grow and love and all of that. They want to have these guys that they can revere. But they, you know, they, they adapted to the one and done style because Calipari was winning with it. Now that he's not winning with it, I think they want to turn more towards that traditional style of having four-year guys or multi-year guys in any regard um, that stick around and build the program and build a sustained level of success while, you know, bringing in one or two of those high-level guys. Yeah, you got to get like a Patrick Patterson type, uh, Alex Poitras, those types of guys yeah. that stick around for a while for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, let's say – let's let's pivot there then. I, I think that conversation really goes for any program nowadays, right? Like, like sure, just yeah. build your roster – um, you know, I have seen more colleges reach back out about high school players. And I think that had a lot to do with the COVID year. And, you know, we had a surplus of players and, and you know, we're starting to see a return back to some more high school um, based stuff. But the transfer portal is not, portal's not closing, right? Like it's not going yeah. back to zero. So that's never going to go anywhere. But I think with Kentucky, certainly you can pick and choose who you want to go get. Um, just whether or not that that roster makes a lot of sense. Like you, as an NBA team, 
pardon me, you can go sign a guy as a free agent, but he may not be the right fit for the roster that you currently have. So um, I think that's really important to kind of look at those um, and how they build that. You almost have to hire like a general manager now uh, for a place like Kentucky or Duke or some of these like high level programs um, to, to be able to help build your roster out. Maybe even salary cap management too. I don't know. Yeah, honestly, you need, you need, I think the first step for those schools is kind of identifying how they want to play and identifying an identity. Right. And then you go get the guys, right. You, you're, yeah. you, that's easy to fill out. Like, you know, going back to Houston, we kind of have like that, you know, that toughness, rebounding, athleticism and all that kind of stuff. So they can just go get guys that fit that system. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Now the question is, okay, let's say, let's say Texas comes together. Okay. okay? Well, let's say that that's the, the exit strategy for Cal Party to go down to Austin. That domino effect in college basketball is bananas now, right? It, it like Kentucky insane. to me sits at the very top of the dominoes and they get tipped and it just, I mean, it, We've had a pretty quiet, all things considered, coaching carousel. We haven't had like 100-plus jobs change. Again, COVID had a lot to do with it. We've had a lot of guys kind of stay the course, having a little bit more patience um, in the economic structure. We had a lot of schools paying out a lot of money, um, just a lot of change. I feel like it's starting to mount, and I think if this happens, we certainly see that carousel just start spinning with no breaks whatsoever. So let's say Cal goes to Austin, Texas, and leads the Longhorns. Um I think we've talked about that enough. I think he goes down there. I think he crushes it, absolutely crushes it. And again, they're moving the SEC, uh, which would be really interesting to see Texas and Kentucky play. God, I would love, I would love that. That's just theater right there. That's like that's a movie. Well, it's like Patino going back to Lexington, right, when he was at Louisville, yeah. right, to play yeah. those games. Um, the question now is who, who, then becomes the Kentucky coach? And I think there's. A lot of names that we can toss out there, but the first I, I want to know, like the first initial name that comes to mind for you is who? Um, I don't know. Okay, so first of all, let me let me buy myself a little bit of time. Okay. Um, I don't think Kentucky is going to go the same. Like we have seen a lot of the most high level jobs open up. We've seen Louisville open up. We've seen UCLA open up. We've seen Villanova open up. We've seen Duke open up. We've seen Kentucky open up. We've seen Indiana open up. Yeah. Those are some of the most bluest of bloods. And a lot of those programs didn't make those big splashy hires, right? I think when you look at that, Mick Cronin to UCLA is the splashiest of those hires. And that didn't really set off, that didn't really trigger this major domino effect. Like Duke hired from within, yeah, yeah. Carolina hired from within, Louisville hired from, you know, relatively within, uh, Villanova hired from, you know, relatively within. And, you know, Mike, uh, Mike Woodson and Indiana, the same thing. I don't think Kentucky's going to do that. They can't do that. Kentucky has to take a big swing. They have to go get an established coach because I don't think their fan base is going to look around and be like, you know, looking at these other programs who are just kind of having average success. Like none of those programs who have hired from within have killed it yet. So I think Kentucky's going to go out, want an established guy. And so with that, it's going to cause a domino effect because you go get an established guy from a high major program that's established, you know, and that's going to leave that spot open. And that's going to leave another spot open. That, that's where that ripple effect comes from. So when it comes to guys who I think they should target, I think Chris Holtman at Ohio State would walk to Kentucky. Okay. That is a guy – I think Chris Holtman, it's, you know, it's a pretty, pretty well-known fact that he grew up in Kentucky. His parents are Kentucky fans. I think that you know, that's a job that he's been eyeing forever. And he's had some success at Ohio State. He's recruited pretty well at Ohio State. So I think he's a guy that could usually transition over there. I think you got to give a phone call to Scott Drew. He's a really good one. Um, he's, you know, he's crushed it at Baylor. He built a perennial winner at Baylor. I think Scott Drew is another guy. And obviously, you got to swing big. So Brad Stevens and Jay Wright, they're going to get named for every single job. So you pick up the phone, give them a call, make them say no. There's right? No way. There's no way. Jay Wright, there's no way that that guy is living. He he picked the most perfect ending to a movie. Um, yeah. There's no way. And Brad Stevens, I, I don't know, man. They, I, I agree that stuff. there's no way, but you got to you got to make it no way you can't not at least try All right, let's get funky let's get funky you know who i wrote down in that conversation who you got oh that's a dude that would be that's a spicy one right there spicy Imagine tennessee to auburn to kentucky like spicy All right. that is what about, so, what about okay what about what about a guy who's really really been killing it on recruiting he's had some pretty good success so far in the sec in uh, Eric Musselman, he's got the energy to make. Oh, okay, Musselman. okay. I'm actually not mad at that. I think Muss's personality would fit perfectly. Yeah, I actually, I actually really like that a lot. I, I like that a lot. That being said, 
I would. <laughs> I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get some hate mail on this one. Arkansas is not messing around. They will not be trifled with at all when it comes to their yeah. basketball program. And they've got tons of money up yeah. in Northwest Arkansas. They've got so much support. He's totally killing it. He's getting players. He's getting players. I mean, look at Nick Smith. It was down to Kentucky or Arkansas. He got him. Yeah. Right. He's got the players right now, the freshmen that should be more that, that are playing the way that you would expect Kentucky's freshmen to be playing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's got a great situation there. I don't think, I think that's going to be, that would be a real battle if it were to happen. And um, I, I think Arkansas empties the bank to, to keep him there and to make him a guy. Yeah. But that being said, Musselman is a guy that has, that, that doesn't, that doesn't unpack his bags fully anywhere that he's been in his career. Let me throw another guy out in the SEC just because we're kind of keeping it spicy in the SEC. That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, when you, when at right now, if you're a college basketball program at the highest of level, Eric Musselman, Nate Oates, Scott Drew, I think those are the three guys who you're just like, have to be on your radar have to be you know right at the top of your list and, and yeah all those guys are crushing it and we just saw last night on whenever that was uh wednesday nate oats went into arkansas and you know pick up that win so i think he'd do a great job at kentucky he's recruiting well good coach um fans would love him there great energy he would yeah. definitely buy the sweetest blue jacket that you would need to oh, play yeah. that job all right let me throw out another name too going back to some old school days what about billy donovan you know, go yeah, on. you got you got to try that. I wonder, I wonder what that relationship is like with with Rick Pitino because Donovan's a Pitino guy. So I don't know what the loyalty there would be like, and I don't know what Kentucky's relationship with Rick Pitino is. But that is a name that you certainly have to try and reach out to. Well, okay, hold that thought. I'm I'm with you there. Like, I I don't know if Billy Donovan would ever come back to college. I think he's got a really good thing going. I think he's really well respected within the NBA. Yeah. Um, going from the NBA back down to college is such a new and, – and now in today's world is such a different world yeah. that I'm not sure that that's something that he'd want to mess with. No. Um, but you did, you did mention Patino. Since we're getting wild in this podcast, what about Richard Patino? I, I don't know how Kentucky fans would feel about that. I like Richard Patino. I think he's, he's crushing it at New Mexico. I think he's a really good coach. But I think they want a guy who – they want more of the, the Oats, Muscleman realm of coaches – as opposed to a, a guy who's thriving at New Mexico right now, but you know he didn't he didn't light it up, up at Minnesota, which is a hard job. So I think Kentucky that might be a harder sell on Kentucky fans than it would be for people like you and I. Yeah, you know I remember I was in Eugene when Oregon um, they moved on. You know uh, Ernie Kent had moved on. They they had a job opening that I think lasted almost two months, and they interviewed just about everybody, and everybody was like, "Oh well, Nike is such a." you know, um, influential program and, and brand with it within Oregon's program. And they're, they're going to hire this guy. It's going to be a splash. And Cal Parry's name came up. Everybody's name came up. Literally everybody except for Dana Altman, who was hidden away at Creighton in Omaha, Nebraska. And when they finally went through the recruit, through the recruiting, through the hiring process, they ended up with Dana Altman. I think everybody in Eugene was like, huh, okay. And now the guy's been there for 14 years and has absolutely killed it. Mm -hmm. um, has built Oregon into a powerhouse that you got to contend with only on, not only on the court, but also in recruiting. And I do wonder if Kentucky takes a really similar approach where, like you said, Mick Cronin probably wasn't the name that US, UCLA fans. And I think he's actually perfect for what UCLA needs. He's been awesome. He's been, uh, he's crushing it. Yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal. And same thing. Like you look at, you know, Arizona and kind of the rebuilding mm -hmm. that they've kind of gone through there with, with a guy that, again, wasn't a name that I think a lot of people were super familiar with. Kentucky's different, right? You've got to get a leading man. You've got to get a George. That's why, like, I don't think going that assistant route or like, you know, going to the retread kind of like, oh, remember this name from the past kind of route would work at Kentucky. I think they have to take big swings. Otherwise, that fan base is going to be so pissed off. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what happens. I mean, again, all this could be for naught. You know I mean? Yeah, all this I mean, could be for naught. And, and Kentucky's like, no, we got John Calipari, man. Yeah. Okay. The guys, the guys in a, in a category of his own. Um, it's really hard to win, no doubt about it. We've got to do some things. We've also seen some real. I think the part with Cal Parry that we've got to take notice of is any program that has so many guys that were assistant coaches leave and move on. Like that, that I think that's one thing with Shashevsky that he did really, really well is that that bench was consistent. You know I what mean, I mean? Like they always had a they always had a staff that everybody is, has been there. They've had some legs within the program. Well, Kentucky recently 
it's been a lot of turnover, some new faces, some new names, some younger guys. And I think that's the part that really kind of gets lost in the shuffle where you kind of lose sight. It's like always changing your, your rhythm guitarist in the band. You know what I mean? Like every guy's coming into a band with a whole different style that he comes in with. Or maybe this guy grew up listening to Zeppelin. You know what I mean? This guy grew up listening to The Who. This guy was more of a, of a John and Paul kind of guy. Yeah. You know, with the Beatles, where everybody listened to something differently and was, were inspired by something different. So your identity kind of gets lost along the way every time you keep replacing that lead guitarist. Yeah. Now, the lead singer may stay the same, and the songs may be written the same, but that, that lead guitar does change album to album, and there seems to be a little bit of deterioration along the way. So I do think that's interesting. I don't know, man. Like, I, I'm interested to see what happens. I get it. Yeah. I, I kind of understand why Kentucky's upset. Um, you got high-level players. you got high, huge expectations. But listen, I'm always reminded by this. A year ago this time, Nobody even thought the Cincinnati Bengals were really going to be that good in the playoffs. And here they were, you know, playing in the Super Bowl. And so much can happen. And again, you just need one good tournament. You need three good weeks in the NCAA tournament. And you kind of forget all this happened, you know? Yeah. I, I think ultimately, when we're, you know, sitting here this time next year, I think we're looking at Kentucky with John Calipari as their head coach. Yeah. And if you're a Big Blue Nation, you know, you remember a Big Blue Nation, you're a Kentucky fan, think about it like this. Last year, Kentucky was really, really good during the regular season and got bounced early by St. Peter's. This year, they kind of suck during the regular season. So if they make it in the NCAA tournament, maybe they're going to be the ones doing the bouncing instead. You know, maybe they're going to be the ones upsetting people. It yeah, takes a while, too, for these young guys to kind of figure out who they are. I mean, again, they got a big Oscar in the middle. Not a lot of guys like that guy yeah. in basketball, man, collegiately at least. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, they have Severe Wheeler at point guard, so they do have a little bit of experience. But like you said, Kentucky always has young guys. It takes a while to gel, and, you know, maybe they'll figure it out. Maybe they're, you know, a few years back, Calipari kept mentioning a tweak. Maybe there's a tweak coming. Who knows? We'll see. Could be. Could be. Yeah. Well, this has been fun. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think anybody really knows what's going to happen unless you're inside of Lexington, Kentucky, at the Big Blue Nation itself. Uh, but it sure is fun to talk about. A lot of fun names kind of throughout there, and so we'll see what happens. But this has been a special edition of the Fast Break right here on Hoopsie TV on YouTube. Make sure you like and subscribe to this video. We've got tons of videos from you know player breakdowns, recruiting conversations, and even conversations like this with the Big Blue Nation. Um, and, and we'll see what happens. If, if something does happen, we'll certainly going to talk about it right here on hoopscene.com for josh tech i'm justin young we appreciate you rolling with us let us know in the comments below if john kelly party does leave kentucky who do you want as the new head coach at the university of kentucky let us know love to hear your thoughts and love to see what you think and this uh you know man i, I just trying to wrap my head around the idea that john kelly party is no longer the head coach at kentucky is going to be really hard for me to, to really kind of think through but right now he is and I think if you're Kentucky, you're really glad to have them despite all the things they're going through. So we'll end it right there. Josh, that was fun. Appreciate it.